from Unity Church of San Antonio, a spiritual community practicing how to be the light of the world, we bring you this message to remind you of your true nature, which is divine. Here now is Reverend Linda Martella Whitsett. Well, I have about 15 pages of notes, guys. I it's absolutely ridiculous. It's not, not all going to happen this morning. <laughs> I am just um, filled to the brim with, um, with thoughts and a lot of emotion, surprising emotion. Um, I think I'm really feeling the holiness of this Memorial Day weekend. You know, it comes around every year, but for some reason, this year, I'm so, uh, I'm so attuned to... Um, the vibration of gratitude and memory. So I'm thinking about memories, and I've done a lot of reading and watching some videos, and maybe that's why I'm feeling it, because I'm feeling the force of so many personal stories um, that have felt like such a privilege for me to get a peek into uh, people's private, most deep feelings have been um, shown to me as I've been reading some stories about veterans and their experience, um, everyone has a heartwarming story and in some cases heartbreaking story, especially as veterans reflected back on the lives of loved ones that, that were killed right by their side in the war, um, that they grew up with and, and went to be buddies with in the war and then one came home and the other didn't. You know, the stories of kindnesses, you know, 40, 50, 60 years later, um, such as Maggie told me this morning about um, uh, an American veteran that, that had kept a memento of a Japanese flag that was uh, important to the family and all these years later returns it to the family uh, and children of the of the Japanese soldier had never met their own father, but re-encountered their father in this significant artifact, you know? Amazing stories of, of people waking up to find the importance in the memories, in many cases, memories that have been long um, suppressed. This is one thing I found in these accounts and I could read you a lot of personal stories, but there's some common themes that I find, especially the older a veteran is, the more likely they have um, been reluctant to speak so directly to their war experience. You know, they say things such as, um, like um, that, that it's painful to remember that I have intentionally not wanted to talk about it uh, because there were such horrors I experienced and things that I hadn't expected at such a young age to have to do and to see. In many cases, an entire generation uh, of years goes by before there seems to be even permission to speak. So these bottled up memories, painful memories, even moving memories, um, sometimes come out like a, the popping of a cork, such as when um, National Public Radio Story Corps comes around and somebody, you know, a grandchild sits down with their grandparent and begins to hear for the first time some of their experience from a war long, long past and relegated to history. Uh, but for these individuals, when they start to speak, it's like the floodgates open and all the pressing emotion uh, of these very significant moments in their experience all come back vividly in many cases. They might not remember every detail, but they remember the moment, the horrifying moment, the touching moment. about these experiences that these that the memories are traumatic you know they're fresh memories they feel as if they just happened yesterday when they come back um, they resurface the feelings are fresh 
Another commonality is that very often their memories are unreconciled because they've not really dealt with haven't felt even even um, that that it was you know for their own permission self permission to dwell upon them but until they become addressed sometimes they're not able to be reconciled and harmonized you know for a young person to recognize for example when they turn 80 years old that that you know, they went to war at a time when they were very young and they followed rules. I was thinking about this in terms of, you know, the purported enemy. I, I was reading about um, the, a recent trial of uh, a German soldier, an Auschwitz trial. Uh, the, the man was like 18 years old when he was a guard at the death camp. And he's on trial today and he's saying, I, I, I don't know how I could have allowed myself to do that. I don't know. I don't know how I could have participated in that. And I wish I could have done something to stop it. You know, and my heart says, you know, to to further wound a person who's living living with the wounds of the horrors of, of what they participated in. Um, I don't know that there's justice in that personally. I just know that it doesn't matter which side of a war you're on, that the death and the destruction and the, the troubling encounters you have stay with you and become a haunting on your life. And they, they're not personal to you, even though you might not, the, the veterans might not speak of them because we are one, there is a vibration that gets carried forth in the, in the atmosphere in which we all live in these memories. And this is why, of course, uh, the, peace, the peace knower within me um, longs for the days when we no longer see war as a solution, right? I think we can all agree that would be a day to celebrate. But this gets me thinking about memories in general. You know, we, it's easy to believe that our memories are intact, that we, that we can recall an important occasion, you know, today, just like when it happened years ago. But psychology tells us something different. Brain science tells us something different. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, each time, neuro neuroscientists say each time we recall something from our memory, it changes for this reason that we have changed, for one, and not just energetically or psychologically, but scientifically, biologically, we are different. The, the you that remembers what you were back then today is a different you. That literally our, our brains change. And in fact, the proteins, I mean, this is too scientific for my understanding, but the proteins that are involved in memory are not identical when we recall that memory again. New proteins are formed in that new memory. So you can see that over time that memory changes. And sometimes it gets muddied. And sometimes it, it you know, we, we end up inserting things that really didn't happen, but they sure seem like they must have happened, <laughs> right? So memory's tricky, isn't it? They're not set in stone like the etchings on the tombstones, right? They're not. They're fluid. They surface. They, they uh, suppress. They rise again. They, they flow. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at what's what's in my heart to say about this, because there's more than I could speak of. It's no doubt that memories are essential to us, as Charles Fillmore's quote really impressed upon me in the video as we began today. The mind makes the person. So it seems to me it's not just that we have memories, that we have impressions of what happened in the past, but it's what we make of them. It's what our mind tells us is important about our past that is what is significant. So the past itself is not what makes us. It is what we say about the past that makes our present and that will go with us.
here. <clears throat> because really, all that we have, all that we have com concluded about what God is, what we are, what life is about, what's important in life, all of those assumptions that we've made throughout our life all come with us into our present and, and are the fertile field in which our future becomes born. So it seems to me that, that attuning to this mind, dealing with this mind, is really the, where our power is. And this is what I love about the unity teachings, you know? How we integrate our past is really what matters. We're either imprisoned or liberated by our own meaning making. You know, and I think about this even in religious terms. I mean, it's... It, uh, the unity teachings about self-mastery are sort of like a, a Buddhist-friendly potential for us to relieve our suffering. You know, because we could look more kindly upon our memories of our childhood, for example, if we had troubles in our childhood. I mean, and who didn't, right? I mean, you know, we all, we all have growing pains, right? But it is really our ability... We, we can carry the struggles of our past into our present, but we could look more kindly upon them. We could reinterpret them in such a way that they are turned toward good. And then that benefits us in our present and as we move toward our future. So it's kind of like uh, the Christian-friendly term salvation. It's like we're, that, that salvation is being saved. And what saves us is our own shift of mind. It is the renewing of our mind that, that saves us or that liberates us from the imprisoned thoughts of, of how we have seen ourselves in relationship to our own memories. So this law of mind is really the key in the unity message. I mean, unity is like a lot of other disciplines except this is really, I think, the hallmark of the unity principles, that the thoughts that we harbor are the thoughts that we are actually cultivating, and they are the thoughts that will bear fruit. It's an important thing for us to remember. Within weeks of giving birth, uh, new mothers often forget the pain of labor. How could we do that? I and mean, who would have a second child? was still there. You know what I'm saying? And if you were lucky enough to just go, ooh, ooh, I think I'm in labor and give birth, and I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I'm not talking to you. <laughs> but really, this is the thing that, that what science has told us is that women who have had an overall pretty positive experience of birth tend to forget than those that didn't. So, you know, there, there is that principle of um, the emotion and the intensity around a memory, right? But the other thing is that the joy of that new birth be ends up superseding. It becomes a higher value to us than uh, the labor that was involved to bringing it about. So there's, it's, a, it's part of the way the principle works. Uh, you know, in the Jewish tradition, the idea of memory is very important. Uh, they're told, we're told, the Jewish people, it's, it runs all through the Jewish scriptures. Remember. Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Exodus. Remember uh, Mount Sinai. You know, remember. Remember God. And it also says it the other way, the, the plea for God to remember us. Remember me. Remember me. Now, in other words, um, keep my mind stayed on the principle, the principle. So I used to think that, that uh, and this was just my judgmentalness, that it was like perseverating to keep, keep doing the Exodus thing year after year after year. Like we don't do that in Christianity, right? <laughs> you know, the crucifixion, the crucifixion, the crucifixion, year after year after year after year. You know, I used to think, well, something's wrong with that. Why do we keep commemorating these dark times and this, this, um, this negativity? But I was just looking at it wrong, that's all. And that says something about me, you know, where my mind went to it. Because here's what I think, that remembrance is an important principle. And in Judaism, the memory is of the goodness of life and the benevolence of that divine um, spirit of love and life and power, that benevolence. Remember that, that's really what 
the scriptures and the stories are all about. It's not remember our hardship. It's remember that those hardships were relieved. Remember that we overcame. Remember that we stood up and triumphed. And isn't that worth remembering in your own life experience? Isn't it worth remembering the times when you're feeling hardship today that you can remember having hardships in the past, but you can remember them passing. You can remember you're standing taller because you walked through those hardships standing tall in integrity. And because of that, you, you are stronger today. That's the spirit of the real memory. And when I started to look at it that way, I thought, well, of course we want to remember. You know, of course we want to remember. Whew. Well, there's a whole other bunch of this that I can talk about. But, you know, that's not even important because this isn't about me teaching a lesson today. It's about our reflection. So, you know, where are you when you think about your past? Think about your childhood. Think about Wayne Dyer. Remember Wayne Dyer, this beautiful teacher of us all. When he was a child... His father abandoned his mother and the whole family. And because of that, his mother felt like she couldn't take care of him, and she put him in an orphanage. And Wayne Dyer became raised by a series of foster parents through the years and, and experienced the kind of really rough kinds of childhood experiences that often go hand in hand with a foster experience. And yet, he grew, he overcame in his later years as he studied and learned. And he came to believe uh, that it was so important to heal those traumas, to see them in a new way, to revise your story, to come back around to those painful moments, but to see them in a new light, to make greater meaning of them, to see them as a productiveness in your life. He said, if you can heal those traumas, it becomes a wake-up call for you to practice forgiveness and to get rid of the hate that has been in your heart since childhood. You know, that's how he experienced it. And I wonder, you know, if this what I see in the veterans community is a similar thing. You know, we hear more and more stories of veterans who are meeting for the first time someone they fought with in a war long ago, or meeting the families of those, of those uh, enemy soldiers and connecting with them heart to heart and well above the feeling of conflict and, and difference but in the spirit of the unified experience of human life on planet Earth together. See, this is what I believe can bring about peace, and this is about shifting the memory, turning it from being just some awful thing that happened to something that can produce a new spirit of unity and peace. So on this Memorial Day weekend, let me invite you you know, you don't have to have been a veteran to have your own memories that need a little of attending to. So there's a chance for you to revisit some things in your life that haven't been beautiful, but, but bring some new beauty to them. See the good that has flowed in your life, maybe even because of those memories. So let's take some time for meditation, just a few minutes, because we're, um, we're, running, we're running a little late. But we can breathe, right? Take a few minutes and just breathe, guys, just breathe. And acknowledging that so often we don't deal with a difficult memory because, because it's difficult, because we have to feel some feelings. And if we could know that just by breathing, by opening our heart, that we're, we're safe, that a memory and the feeling attached to that memory will never hurt us but may heal us. So whatever is opened in you from these messages this morning, 
let your feelings be holy. Let your memories be holy. Let the memory of those that, that mistreated you be holy. Let your own dealing with the things that you've done in your life for which you regret, let them be a holy awareness. For to be holy is to be whole, complete. So we acknowledge in this moment that there's nothing missing from our life. There's nothing that stands outside of wholeness. It is the mind that makes us. So we attune our minds to the truth of our oneness with one another, with all who have walked the path ahead of us, with all those rainbows in our clouds, We are one. We are holy. So breathing in and then exhaling, we say, let it be. Let it be so. And so it is. And so it is. Amen. This message has been brought to you by Unity Church of San Antonio to open your heart, transform your life, and celebrate your divine identity. Visit us on the web at www.unityofsa.org And remember, you are the light of God, so shine brightly today.